Welcome everybody to Central St. Martin's Product, Ceramic and Industrial Designs Design Transforms Lecture Series. In this series, design practitioners share their insights, experiences and thoughts on the idea of design transformation examined through the lens of their work. Speakers discuss how their work has changed things, pieces, places and people, and crucially how designing has changed them. I can't think of a more suitable candidate for this talk than Tom Caron. Tom has had an illustrious career, though many would argue that he deserves far greater recognition for his contributions to British design in the last century, where he started out as a designer for the aircraft industry, for Ford motor cards, working on white goods for Hot Point and Philips. He later became chief designer and managing director at Ogle Design where his client list included Airbus, Renault, Raleigh, Electrolux, British Rail, British Aerospace, London Transport, Kittycraft and Renault, to name but a few. He conceived and developed designs for everything from trucks to toys, double-decker buses, aircraft and a Pope mobile or two. Under his stewardship, he's developed many young talents who went on to found businesses and high level positions of their own. In Ogle, he formed a template of design practice that many have followed since. Always a committed and generous educator, Tom has taught multiple people in prestigious institutions and schools internationally. His creative products have come to emblematize an era, such as the Bond Bug, a two seat, three wheeled car, loved by many and currently celebrating its 50th anniversary year. He also invented toys like Marble Run, which is a cross-generational success. The iconic Rally Chopper, along with the Reliance Scimitar, a car beloved of Royals and currently featuring in Netflix Series 2 of The Crown. From his early life in the former Czechoslovakia, his journey fleeing Nazi Germany across continental Europe, and his formative years in the UK as a refugee, landing on these shores with little to low money. Through his training at an institution which is now known as Central St. Martins, to his ascent to the top of the design profession. And in his later years, as a creative polymath and design mentor, uh, all of which is described in his newly published book, Toymaker, in which Tom presents some of the most cherished items that tell a story, not just of an extraordinary life, but show the importance of nurturing one's imagination. Written with the award-winning novelist and journalist Richard Asquith, Toymaker spans a century of art, wonder, invention, and innovation. Please, everybody, welcome Tom Caron, OBE. Sending you greetings to all my lockdown uh, audience. My name is Tom Karen. Um, I and I run a company called Ogle Design for nearly 40 years, and we specialize in product and transport design. And I had a wonderful model shop, model prototype shop. We were able to build a double decker bus. We built a the Y fighter for the Star Wars films. And uh, in the picture you can see we are building the fuselage for the Jetstream 41 aircraft, which uh, was air conditioned and uh, uh, made a very good impression at the Paris Air Show.
I used to I used to give talk to students, and uh, the subject uh, that they find particularly useful was what I call the ingredients of a successful design, maybe the magic ingredients of a su successful design. When I talk to students, I always say, rules are made to be broken, so you have to remember that. So that's really page one, okay? So rule ingredient number one is sculptural quality. I, I worship good form and uh, every 3D object to me is a piece of sculpture and it has to be a mixture of uh, soft and hard shapes and uh, uh, every line and every form needs to have a logical beginning and end. You, you can see this on the Henry Moore sculpture. And then um, after I retired, which is uh, 20 years ago, I started making, making things that amused me. And one of them one was this bird and uh, the same ingredients still apply. And I made this bird and I like to think that it's got a nice shape. And you can see very clearly how every line and every form has a logical beginning and end. Another ingredient is color, color. And uh, it's not my strong point because I actually studied aircraft engineering and uh, my first job was in Luton as a stressman and uh, I was very bad at it because um, I'm not a mathe mathematician. But um, at some point uh, I saw an advertisement for somebody to do technical illustration and I'd never done any, any of that. But um, I copied some pictures out of uh, a book from Luton Library and I got the job, it doubled my money, my, my salary, and I went to a very nice part of uh, Surrey for, for my next uh, stage doing, doing this illustration. Uh, during that time, life sort of opened up. I started doing pottery and uh, um, I also started making a little vehicle which long time later became became the, the bond bug so having not uh, studied anything about color i had to do it intuitively and uh, it was obvious of course that uh, you couldn't uh, sell a green ferrari or a uh, um, or a brown toothpaste but um, other things are a bit less obvious but black for example shows something that is good solid and quality and light colors go for medical and, uh, and food, food products. And the right color can enhance a project pro product. And um, we had the opportunity of putting a special body on an Aston Martin. And uh, it was to promote a brand of cigarettes and it, it had to be dark blue so I stuck my neck out and made the inside a very bright green, a lovely moquette that came from Denmark. And that combination just uh, worked very well for me. And actually another, another little bit of um, adventure was when I, when I was at Ford, I worked at Ford and um, I took part in a competition and um, I noticed that uh, one of my colleagues there was also entering and he had studied the, the taste of the judges for this competition. And I departed from that. And as you can see from the picture, the exterior is brown and the interior is green. I was really taking a chance, but I won the competition. I, I suppose I ought to add that um, 
Uh, women are much better at color than men. They are they very rarely or never uh, color blind, and uh, they make uh, de de decisions about the product on the strength of the color more often than than a man would, like the interior of a, of a motor car. Yet another important uh, ingredient is a focal center. And uh, what I mean by that is when you meet a person, you automatically look at their face, their eyes and their mouth. And that is the focal center. And you can wonder from there on. But that's where your uh, it, it attention is, is, is caught. And uh, the painter John Constable, he was very much aware of focal centers and I've got this picture of, uh, of this white cow in the middle of this white landscape and uh, it was even, it's even called a white cow and you can't help but starting there with a white cow looking at the rest of the picture, that is the focal center. And, and he, here I've got another picture of um, an Alfa Romeo front 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 end, and it's 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 a gorgeous sort of focal center. We didn't design the Alfa Romeo, but uh, you cannot help but uh, start there and looking at the rest of the car. Another important uh, ingredient is theme theme. And what I mean by that is that um, a vehicle in particular uh, is made up of lots and lots of components, anything from the body to the door handle to, to the steering wheel to the instruments to the seats. And so then quite a number of people who work on a particular project. But it doesn't want to look as if a lot of people have worked on the independent independently, regardless of the fact that sometimes there are even separate studios for exterior and interior. So what is needed is a theme that runs right through the product. And um, I'm, I've got here a, a picture of um, the, the Leyland uh, T45 uh, truck cab. It's actually a full-size model that we made. The theme here are the sausages on the front. We actually started with the sausages that may, were part of the door handle detail because uh, th there is a need to extract air from inside the cab and had a little sausage-shaped grill there. So the sausages became the theme and I had them on the front, on the steps on the floor inside, uh, on the pedals, uh, around the instruments. There were sausages everywhere, and that was, that was the theme for the, for the, for the truck. It incident, incidentally, it, it, uh, it became truck of the year. It was really was a very nice, 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 nice design. I'm very pleased with it. There's something else that is worth noting on this truck. And uh, that is that instead of having a very aggressive grill, it just had a little sausages. And the focal center was the windscreen with a black, uh, what we call the pouch, that, that completed a nice frame, frame for the driver. And that became a focal center and uh, it worked very well. Another ingredient is stru structural, if I can get it out, structural logic. And that is, uh, Henry Moore said he didn't like his sculptures to look as if they might be taking off like a rocket and uh, uh, here's an example of it, but um, there's a, 
a, a sculptor called Bernard Rosenthal, and uh, I think he ought to be better recognized that he is. He, he be made a, a wonderful uh, cube steel sculpture that stands outside one of the um, uh, skyscrapers in Manhattan. And it's, it's, it stands on one point, as, as you can see from the picture. And it, 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 it is a, 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 a great example of, of structural illogicality in the sense that you wouldn't want to have a picnic under, under it because uh, it obviously is not, is not sta sta stable or potentially not stable. But um, um, a bit on the same theme, um, architects t tend to like cantilevers, like having balconies that stick out a long way and uh, again, they, they attract attention by the very fact that they haven't got uh, structural logic. And uh, I would always feel comfortable, uncomfortable on such a bank, bank, bank balcony in case somebody has a party with a big rumpus jumping up and down on this uh, cantilevered structure. Uh, I, I, I describe it as look no no look no hands when when that is done. Another ingredient that um, is important to me is what I call what I call respect for materials. Every material has a bit of a mind of its own and it can be pushed so far, but not, not any further. And so, um, for example, uh, in die casting or injection molding, you have to push material into a mold and it doesn't like being pushed into sharp corners. And those will be the, the weak points of it as well. With, and, and, not very friendly shapes anyway. And also if, for example, somebody designs a, a steel panel that has to be pressed and it isn't well designed, in the process of pressing, they might, might, it might tear. What you then have to do is to use thicker gauge material or, or more expensive type of uh, quality of um, uh, uh, specification to, to achieve the same thing, all of which means you're spending more money than necessary. And um, using, using wood terribly well, I love uh, Michael Thorne, who makes the most beautiful chairs. And they, are, they use wood very well. They're comfortable. They're good looking. They're strong, and they're affordable, and uh, uh, you, the chair illustrated is called the Wiener chair, and, and, and uh, I, I, I love it. But um, um, there, are, there are seats that are beautiful and strong and very expensive, and they're not very good seats. An example of this that I show it is the Barcelona chair and I can think of an occasion when I visited a, 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 a car maker and in the reception there was these Barcelona chairs and I, I was trying to find somewhere to sit rather than there than one of these because when you sit back in it and the person you come to see appears through the door you want to get up, you have to sort of laboriously shuffle to the front end of the seat, and then you don't have any, any, any um, uh, armrest to, 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 to push against. And it's, it's, 
it's it's very very uh, very untidy way to 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 get up from a from 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 a Barcelona chair, beautiful as it is. Another important ingredient is simplicity, and uh, I'm showing you again a picture of the Bond bug, and it's uh, celebrating its 50th anniversary, which is why I have this special mug here. And what the bug is, it has only three wheels, which means you can throw away one wheel and suspension. It um, has a triangular chassis. Now, a triangular chassis doesn't have any twist on it, and therefore it's lighter and cheaper, and that's a, 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 an advantage. And then the bug has a flat windscreen. My colleagues at Ogle thought I was ruining, ruining it with a flat windscreen, and I, I nearly went to curved windscreen, which would have cost twice as much but I stuck with it and nobody has ever drawn attention to my, to my flat windscreen. And then, very important, the body is made of very few shells and they're, they're, they can be pulled out of a mold without any undercuts. Now, the reasoning behind it is that um, I knew it reliant they make molds that had to be held together with nuts and bolts about every fin five, five inches apart. And so some poor, poor chaps would have come, in, come to, to work on Monday morning knowing that they will be, will be bolting and unbolting umpteen nuts and bolts uh, during the rest of the week. And I wanted to avoid that. And the prototype we built actually had no, no panels that had any undercuts. In other words, you could put, pull each shell out of a mold without it being caught up. And, and there were very few shells. The, the main shell formed the nose, the floor, the seat, and the back. There's one mold that could come straight out of a mold. And then, of course, it, it um, it only had one door, which was just another money sa saving, and all bugs were painted orange. Again, a, a, an element for simplicity. And I suppose there's a sort of rule you could quote, it's worth trying, and that is, it's, it's a good idea not to change from one thing to another uh, um, more than once. So an example of, 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 of this is that uh, I've got a picture here of uh, Werloth Cathedral, and it has umpteen saints all across the facade, but because it's, they're all made of the same stone, you have a change of form but you have no change of anything else, material or color or anything. And if all the saints had been painted in different colors, I don't think the, the, the facade would have been as successful. Another example of simplicity is a vehicle body, which is made up of steel and glass and rubber, and maybe a grill that has a particular texture. But it doesn't want to have a change of from one thing to another, from the steel to the glass, from the glass to the bonnet, to the bonnet to the grill. It, it, it can be made all of one of one simple form to, to, to look right. Henry Dreyfus, uh, an American, very good, good designer, American designer, designed a clock, and perhaps he thought it was something that might be used for traveling, but he made sure, he, he concentrated and make it fairly light. A 
And when the product actually came into the shops, he went to a big store to see how people would react to it. And he watched a lady come along uh, shopping for a clock, and um, she had all these clocks lined up, and she weighed them up, and she went away with, with a clock that was fairly heavy. And it taught him a lesson because um, the weight conveyed soli soli solidity, and that was what she was paying for. I've, I've, I've been in an in a interesting situation with a, a radio called the Bush TR-130. And the story behind it is that um, when I arrived at, at Ogle uh, and took over after David Ogle was killed in a car crash, his biggest client was Bush Radio. And uh, he had designed uh, something called the, the TR-82, which was a great success. But of course, I'd never designed a, a radio in my life, so they gave us six months notice, and I was potentially losing an awful lot of uh, uh, turnover. So luckily, I designed the TR-130, and it's got nice solid shapes. And um, the, the, the over the scale, the, 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 the sort of window over it is, is, is a lens shape instead of being a flat bit of glass, which was quite commonly used. And uh, the die casting on top added a bit to the weight of the, of the radio. And it's very nice to grab hold of it from the top without using the handle. And uh, it, it uh, became a very successful radio, the, the best-selling ra radio of the 60s. And um, this um, quality of being grabbable is quite important because you can even, when you look at it without touching, you can picture yourself grabbing hold of it and uh, um, grab ho grabability is also important when it comes to um, picking something up if you can or, or operating something because if you can use do it with one hand instead of two it's 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 a very desirable thing to do because not everybody has two free hands or two good hands to 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 handle things. A final final ingredient that uh, I commend to anybody is something called piquancy, and piquancy is that little bit that you can add to a product that uh, makes it special, like adding a touch of mustard to a steak. It's, it's a small amount that makes all the difference. And um, in the case of the bug, if you can, we can look at it again. On the front, on the nose, it's got an, an air intake that is developed from the aircraft industry and uh, it's, it's a bit glamorous. I don't know that it is the, the, the was necessary for the sake of getting air in that particular spot, but um, it, 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 it was a nice little touch. But otherwise, the bug, as I mentioned, is, is very simple, ultimately simple. But by contrast, there's the chopper it had little chrome springs under the under the saddle, which did nothing. They were make believe. It had uh, it had make believe disc brakes in 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 the rear wheel because I felt they needed a bit of furnishing. The mud guards were well off the wheels to look as if there was suspension on the wheels, which of course there wasn't. The bike was very heavy. It was very heavy, very expensive, but 
the bug was a commercial failure, despite the fact that it's one of my favorite projects together with the marble run that I did. Whereas the uh, um, chopper bike became a huge sort of icon, uh, icon, all of which proves that rules are made to be broken. <laughs> So the magic ingredients of a successful product take them to heart. And here we have the sculptural quality, which I worship good form. And color, which I'm not very good at. But uh, I coped somehow, intuitively. Here's the famous focal center with the Alfa Romeo and uh, also the Leyland truck. Yeah? And then you want to have structural logic. That's very important. You don't want things to look as if they're going to fall over or take off. And then of course I've got the theme which is very necessary when you have a very complicated uh, product. And this is respect for material, where I mention my lovely Thonet chairs, and I've got two of them, and I just love his work. Okay, here's the famous Solidity, the TR-130 Bush radio, best-selling radio, okay? Picancy, the mustard that goes with the steak. And this is the other quality, simplicity, one change at a time. Yeah, this is coming to the end of my talk. Well, thanks once more for joining us, Tom. Very generous of you to share your time and your thoughts. I have a few questions for you that have been submitted by our students. Under your direction, Ogle became a pioneering and highly influential firm. Learning from hindsight, what would be your best advice for building and maintaining a successful design business? Well, hello everybody, good, good to see you and please bear with me the complication of giving a talk in, in this kind of form. But um, uh, how, how would one start? I think, I think we're in a, in a, uh, in a period of sp specialization and uh, uh, to create something like old design today would be quite difficult. What happened in, in the case of David Ogle, he, he, he was very good at doing radios, record players and televisions, and his bush were his big clients. And then he, he, he wanted to do design motor cars and uh, he was such a lively uh, larger than life character that uh, he managed to get to car enthusiasts with a lot of money who were prepared to back him to to make Ogle into a company that would uh, design design motor cars and uh, that's how it came about but um I, 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 th I think probably today one would have to start as a special, specialization and gradually go from there. It, it, uh, I think life has changed 
the one thing you always have to do is to do very good design. There's no escaping from that. So I, I think that may not be helpful what I'm saying, but um, probably specialization and branch out from there and uh, make a go of it and, and have a bit of luck behind it. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, uh, what about keeping a business going, Tom? Starting out is one thing, but maintaining a business that was successful in the way that Ogle was for such a long period of time must take some other skills as well. well I, I think I was... I, th I think I was enormously lucky. I, I was lucky to walk into a situation where a design office had already been established and it was working and it had good PR because, because of the motor car that he had designed. And somehow I was good enough not to, not to, to keep my the clients he had and to build on that and a particular one I think it's mentioned earlier uh, his biggest clients before the motor cars was Bush Radio and uh, and uh, it was des they, they gave us notice when, when, when I came along and I was desperate to keep them and they, I managed it and then designed the the, the PR 130 radio, which was quite a successful thing. So, so that was it. But um, uh, I have a note. I don't know. I mustn't anticipate you. <laughs> was I going to get a question about uh, my, my refugee and, and, and yes, yes, in you okay. In in your book, you describe your experiences as a refugee in the 1940s, and that influences your worldview. Could you tell me about how this has informed your work? Well, I, I, I think the thing about being a refugee in a, in a new position is the fear of failure. You can't afford to fail, and uh, I was uh, I I went to Loughborough to do aircraft engineering, and I came out in 1945, the end of the war, but I managed to get a job, but it was in Luton, and it was in a stress office. I was earning five pound fifteen a week, which is I was. Uh, about two pounds of that was going on taxes. And I was living in digs with outside loo. And that was just about the low point of my career. On top of that, I wasn't very good at stressing because I'm not a very good mathematician. The only, the only tiny, light, nice thing I managed to do, I could always draw and I actually drew a couple of uh, cartoons, aircrafty cartoons for a very good magazine and sold them for more money than I got in a week's pay. So that was nice, but I knew I had to get out. And um, I, I saw an advertisement for a, a technical illustrator still in the aircraft industry. And of course, I had never done anything like that before. So I went to, I went to Luton Library and picked out some a book about technical illustration and copied the drawings. And the person interviewing me, uh, he didn't know any better. He could see right. I could do technical drawing. On top of that, I had a diploma in aircraft engineering. So, I I. I couldn't couldn't be a better candidate, so my salary doubled. The office came to the, to be at the Croydon Airport, and more important, I got digs 
in a lovely uh, uh, um, stockbrokerish type of village where you could take part in the communal activities, everything from tennis to amateur dramatics. And I started doing uh, work with clay. I think I, I could always work with clay and I've done a lot of work with clay. I love it. And uh, at some point I started making a little vehicle, which was a three wheeler with a windscreen that folded forward. And uh, it was the beginning of, of the bug really. But um, I, I, the, during, during this sort of second period down in Ansari, I suddenly realized uh, that I really needed to be an industrial designer. And, uh, uh, and then I had an extremely extraordinary bit of luck and luck just plays such an important part in one's life. And that was that I got some compensation money from Czechoslovakia from one but I lost because we lost a great deal there. And it enabled me to cut free and 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 uh, and uh, have the freedom to maneuver. And what I did, I went to the central, and the central was the beginning of my career in 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 industrial design. I wasn't uh, there for very long, but from there, I got a job at Ford, and from Ford I progressed. Um, uh, I there again, uh, I'm in danger of spreading myself too much, but uh, if that's okay. But there was a lady from the design council, Mrs. Tomale, who, uh, who picked me out as perhaps being a designer with some future, and uh, she became a kind of fairy godmother and she said to stay at Ford for for four years and then get out. And I just did it. I didn't question that. And from there I went uh, briefly from David Ogle. He had a very small office and just uh, three designers then. And from there I went to Hotpoint and then Phillips. And then poor David Ogle was, was killed in a car accident. And um, uh, I got a phone call. This happened on a Saturday. And on Monday, I got a phone call from one of his directors at Ogle. And he said, would you like to come and talk to us? And the following Saturday, we had lunch up there. And I was offered the job of, sort of MD and chief designer. I mean, it's an extraordinary situation to to suddenly be in that position because at Philips I was the manager, but I was managing three people and it, it wasn't a very great responsibility. I didn't have to look after the money side of things. So suddenly I became a, the boss of Ogre and I, 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 I think I did good design. But uh, it 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 uh, it kind of developed. I, I was able to finish some work on cars and uh, uh, got Electrolux and uh, as, a, as a client, and things went on from there. Mm -hmm. So um, but okay. I I I meant to say early on. Can, can I, when I can recap the, my, my Luton period was, was the uh, lowest point of my career because in 45, my, my, all my family had gone back to Czechoslovakia and I was, I was all alone in this country and had to make my way and, 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 you know, to, to, to make my way. And luckily I, 
I survived that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Sorry to be so untidy, you know. <laughs> not, not at all. Um, well, so when, moving on to your designs, Tom, which of your commercial designs do you re revisit with the most pride and joy? Well, I think from 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 the, the the ingredients, you might you might know that um, um, the bun bug means the world to me because I don't wanted to do it for so long. And uh, when I when I started with Roland, I. I I tried to talk them into doing such a car, a little too sporty, two seat, two seater, and they weren't at all interested. And um, then they made made a mistake actually of of uh, buying Bond, and suddenly they needed to put a new product into 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 the Bond lineup, and they said, "Okay, we'll give you a chassis," and it was a a shortened version of the chassis uh, meant for the Robin. And I said, you can do it, do, do your, your, your three wheeler. And uh, we, we built a prototype at Ogre. It, um, and it was, it, 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 it had, it had, it had this amazing, uh, uh, simplicity about it, in that um, uh, you know, the, the chassis with chassis with triangular chassis without twist, only three wheels. The body was a gem of simplicity to make it. It was fantastic. It had a single door. It had a all one color. It had a flat windscreen, and it it uh, it was a bit of an exercise of making something out of nothing. You know, you had um, it really was a th just a three wheeler with an ordinary engine and two seats. You know, but it it was such a gem. But um, but uh, the, perhaps I should, could add, I think it might, it was a commercial failure, no question about that, but um, it, I think it might have been more successful if there had been more time taken to development, if at launch time there were more vehicles available, they only had two because there were a lot of strikes in the industry and um, and then they they missed the summer season for for selling them, and then uh, it it, um, um, it 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 somehow the enthusiasm faded very tightly. But it is the subject of a a great enthusiast uh, owning bugs. There's a lively club. There are owners around around the world, and, and I'm still very proud of it. But um, to answer your question completely, the product that really I love and has been really successful commercially is the the Marble Run, and um, it um, it just came about because I saw my children uh, uh, playing with a wooden one where all that happened is you could feed the marbles at the top and they go, go zigzag down to the bottom and then you can feed them again. And I thought um, if, um, if you could, um, if you could uh, make, make a sort of construction type of toy out of it, where you could put it in, into different configurations and and having labored to do that, which took a certain effort, you know, in a way, it was a challenge, but having achieved that, you then put the marble around 
and you had the the reward so you get the 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 the, the challenge and 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 the reward and and we i um i i thought about how to do this furiously and and uh, uh, i filled my sketchbooks in the following days of with ideas of how to how to do it and they're quite nice sketches and they're in the in the in the archives of the, the vna not doing very much and uh, my model shop i've got a i had a superb model shop and they made a prototype and the prototype worked perfectly it was beautiful and we sold it to kitty craft and it um, there are it it there are i think there must be millions of children who play with it because it went to america and to china and i get such satisfaction to think of all the children who have a chance to play with it it's just just so so satisfying so that that probably in a way my favorite because I, I i i love doing things for children so okay <laughs> All right, so moving on from your commercial designs, what do you think is the biggest single challenge in the century? And do you feel it's addressable through design? Well, I, I'm clear that the, uh, climate change is the biggest worry. I am so worried for my grandchildren and everybody uh, having to cope with it. I don't know how that will pan out. And what can designers do about it? I think uh, um, that we can we can we can design things that are uh, more elegant to manufacture. I mean, let, 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 let me give you an example. When I go to a Waitrose car park, there are all these great cars, and some of them are actually hybrids, so that's a bit of progress. And there may be the Tesla, which is all electric, so hooray, you know, they are mindful about uh, climate change. but. To make a car like the Tesla, it weighs between one and two tons. And the amount of energy required to make a car like that is, I suggest, unpardonable. And I've been working uh, on what I call the greenest car on the planet, which would be a small vehicle that does all the local work that, that needs to be done. But unlike things like the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the smart, and there are similar vehicles from other manufacturers, they, they, they have only two seats. Sometimes they're a bit awkward to, to access. And uh, they don't have any storage for, for shopping. And so my, my, my car, which I also called the S, uh, what am I calling it? STS. Sorry, my main my mind isn't working quite. That's to, to, to do with smarter than smart, because what it has, it's got a triangular chassis. Because of my bug experience, I know that is a good thing. And it has room for the driver and two adults in comfort, 
but it could take three children. So that would cope with most requirements that you need locally. And, and uh, uh, it would be all electric and would have a sort of power pod at the back, which uh, you could easily exchange and update. And uh, uh, it would at the front, I propose a big boot to accommodate a trolley full of, of uh, shopping, which none of the other little vehicles seem to, seem to do. And on top of that, I, I, I want to use renewable materials as much as back. Um, and, and that is, I would like to clad the outside in a, with a kind of sandwich of uh, fabric and some, some stiffener like in bamboo perhaps, or recycled plastic and another fabric on the inside. And the, the designs and, and colors and of, of all these fabrics could be a, a huge number of different designs. And uh, that would give it the sort of wow factor that uh, would make up for the fact that it is isn't a great big four wheel drive. So that's part of the scene. But um, in my, in my, um, in the book, there's a picture of, a, of an aircraft, which I call the air cruiser. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, my talk, I, I worked in the aircraft in industry. And this, this, this uh, aircraft, which I call the air cruiser, uh, I did about 20 years ago. And one of its features is that it, it has a fused out this spread horizontally, there are three interlocking bubbles. And the beauty of that is that the fuse large would actually produce lift. And therefore you have less lift on the wings and the wings are expensive and heavy. And, uh, and it would make a, a more economical aircraft without any questions. And I've been expecting something like that to happen by now, and I'm, I'm surprised that it hasn't. Uh, the other thing, quite a big thing, uh, that um, uh, would make, would benefit the climate situation very well, and that is I did it, I wrote in the nine, 1990 for the DIA year, yearbook, the Design and Industries yearbook, a proposal whereby a proposal to cope with the fact that every morning there is a rush hour that is imposed on people and it means being squeezed into undergrounds and trains and buses and there's a lot of pollution and noise and 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 and, and misery really and that is imposed by the employer and in this uh, article i proposed that the employer should be taxed according to the mileage that their employee have to cover to go to work. And it, it, would, um, it would mean what, what we have a bit at the moment and that a lot of, lot of people would be able to work from home because it would be helpful for the employer to, to do this or the, they could work from satellite offices, but they would, wouldn't have to work from, from Reading and Southend and Brighton to go to London. And uh, the, the main office 
uh, wouldn't have to be a great big building housing a lot of people every week. And and uh, uh, it it um, it it. it, it, it it would end up, I think, by making everybody happier because the 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 the, client, the, the employer, if he plays his card right, would save a, save a lot of, a lot of money because because of not needing a building. The employee would be much happier if there was a need need for meetings that can be done out of working out working. Um, uh, rush hour times. And so um, I, the interesting thing is that about two weeks ago, I saw a piece, uh, there was a piece in my newspaper where somebody is proposing that uh, people working from home should be taxed for the privilege of doing that. And that that is just the reverse of what 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 I'm proposing. So, I I love that. I would love to see my my idea come to life again. It 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 it. it, it I think it has a great deal of merit. Okay. Yes, I think you might find your wish come true. Um, moving on. Uh, what would you say has surprised you the most during your time as a pioneering industrial designer? It's um, what has surprised me is that we're hmm. talking about. Uh, I I'm still surprised that uh, there are there are some designs that that just aren't very very nice I mean I I don't understand why there is this current enthusiasm for freestanding bath and some of them are rectangular in shape which is so unfriendly to our organic shape and they don't have any any means of uh, putting your towels and your soap and your flannel somewhere handy. It, that hasn't been thought about. I did a, actually a, do a, a, a freestanding bath in the 60s for a client and uh, I made it in, in, a, in thick perspex and uh, it had a column standing next to it which which had all the, the the taps and the the the, the spouts and the place for the uh, for, for the for, for for the soap and uh, and and for your and, and your pajamas or whatever and it had a light at the top so you could read by the light of it so I think that that there's room for that but um. um I, I also I also think there is quite a lot of enthusiasm for things like cantilevers because they're sort of striking and bold and and but as I mentioned in in my list of ingredients the idea the, the thought of something that doesn't look solid and well grounded that doesn't appear to me and I and I don't like it and also actually in my note I said something I I I saw if quite recently a, an advertisement for a door handle and of all things it looks as if it was designed to slice salami it really was the most unfriendly shape you can imagine. And I can't understand why anybody can do that kind of thing. And uh, I think I suggested that earlier on about chairs. I think there are quite a lot of poor chairs about. And there's 
there's room for for better chairs and uh, it was in, in the in the 1850s or so there was a designer who 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 pointed out that chairs should really be sloping slightly forward so that when you you're eating or 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 or, or reading or doing some work you can comfortably lean forward and um, I did have the the Norwegian guys who designed that kneeling chair which you may know about which is very healthy but it taxes the knees a, knees a bit but they pointed out that people on horseback always have a very good posture and that's because the angle between the upper body and the upper leg are 130 degrees and if you can approximate that you will sit comfortably and it will be healthy for you whereas when the seats slope forward you just don't get that benefit so that is that one yeah um so Another question from the students. Uh, given your years of experience and all the groundbreaking designs you've been responsible for, the incredible people you've met, what is the single biggest lesson you've learnt? I... Well... I think... I think there's no substitute for doing good design. It, it, there's just no substitute. And the other thing is, you have to be jolly lucky to, 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 to uh, and I was fortunate to, to, to get both. But um, uh, I, 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 I'm a bit failing on that. My answer, I haven't got the very good answer. That will do nicely. That will do nicely. Um, just coming back to some of your product designs, the Bond Bug and the Rally Chopper have become iconic products. Can you put your finger on what you think it is about those designs that trigger such emotional reactions from people? Yeah, it um, the <coughs> the 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 chopper, in a way, uh, uh, had the good luck of uh, of um, an American. Uh, cycle company called Schwinn. He had a type of bicycle that was a sort of machine, a really butch kind of thing. And uh, it it uh, it was a great success. Uh, and, and Raleigh needed to compete with it. And so the in fairness, the concept for doing that kind of peculiar bicycle didn't come from Raleigh or from us. But what we did was to, to make a much nicer version because we were asked quite, quite sensibly to, to do something to compete in that market, but, but to give it a different flavor. So whereas the Schwinn had a very curvaceous frame, uh, the, 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 the chopper had nice straight lines and of course the, the big wheel at the back was a, was a big thing. I, 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 uh, it, it sort of um, uh, symbolizes the power that comes from the, from the back and uh, I had like a Formula One car or a, or a, or a, uh, or a dragster. And I've even put actually big wheels at the back of a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> it's in the vacuum, yeah, and it also looked great. So that was important. And then uh, 
the some 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 little touches that I suppose come under the heading of piquancy or something, but because they weren't for functional, uh, there were the sort of lovely springs under the saddle, which actually didn't do anything. And at some point, I thought the rear wheels needed uh, furnishing and put a sort of make-believe disc brake there. And then the the mud guards were well off the wheel because it looked as if perhaps the, the suspension on the wheel needed that kind of room to, my, to, to, to bounce up and down. And, uh, and all those things helped to make the chopper Chopper, what what it what it was. Um, it the, the other thing we've covered is that the the, the dear dear bug the, that was making something out of nothing that was magic and and when I uh, perhaps I'm anticipating but. I've been retired for 20 years, and uh, when I when I quit, I didn't have a computer on my desk. I hadn't got to that stage, and I and I had to learn all that afterwards. But uh, I, I I moved to Cambridge, and. Uh, it, it it I started a completely new new life. I put behind me industrial design, and uh, and uh, started really a career as a if you like an artist and a, and a craftsman. And uh, I started I started working in all kind of materials because I, I moved into a lovely Victorian house and, and it had a lovely workshop at the end of my garden. And I was able to, to, to make things there. And I, I loved working with my hands and I loved using different materials. And I used uh, wood and, and wire and sheet metal and uh, uh, driftwood and uh, cane and and I made things out of uh, uh, cardboard and, and newspaper again uh, making things out of throw, throw away, away materials and the other thing that happened at that stage is that um, uh, there was a scheme about uh, 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 designers into schools, and I took part in that. And I did workshops in schools, and that was heaven, because children are so enthusiastic and open-minded, and it's 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 just a joy to work with them. And and uh, I did that in primary schools and in Kettle's Yard here in Cambridge and. The Saints Presenter in 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 Norwich and 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 so on and that that was great. And then uh, I I uh, then 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 I had grandchildren arriving, so so that was a great new opportunity to make design make make things. And I've done lots of um, uh, lots of toys for them, and 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 you get the, the feedback, and uh, they don't hesitate actually to give you feedback. Uh, one of my grandchildren wanted a, a a revolver, and I mugged it up, and I made him a a nice looking revolver. I thought. And it came back and said that the geometry wasn't right. You couldn't aim it properly, and <laughs> I, I had to modify it. <laughs> so that that was great. But 
I've got handy in one of my little toys. It's not an ideal toy, but I'm very pleased with it and you may find it fun. I've got here a little aeroplane. I know, can you, can you, can you see it properly? Who is? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. It, it, its special feature is that it has got a peace bomb under it. And when you, when you press, when you press the, 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 the head of, oh, I, am I still being viewed there? Yep. When I press, when you press the, the head of the pilot, the peace bomb drops and it spreads a mist of love and goodwill and ends all conflict. So that was one of my toys that I'm, that I'm quite fond of. That's lovely. So sorry, I've been jumping guns probably. And, uh, are there the That's questions that, that, that are left un, un, unanswered? No, I think you pretty much covered it, Tom. There was just one last question, though, I think we should finish on, which is to do with the place of industrial design in the canon of history in the UK. Uh, when I met you recently uh, at the Jewish Museum exhibition, Designs on Britain, the curators showcased your work alongside other remarkable emigre creatives who arrived in the UK in the 30s of the 40s. Of the many notable examples on display, your creations were the sole representatives of product design there. Might this be an inst instance that indicates a certain attitude or uh, attitude to the representation of industrial design in the canon of British yeah, design? I think it was that complicated. I think that people represented there came from the continent where graphic design was a much more mature design activity than industrial design. And, and the, the designer did this lovely work. They were all fairly established designers, quite a lot older than I, who did the work that was in the exhibition. And so I, I, came, I was so Johnny come later in a way, really. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, 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 I can think. No, I, I think that really answers the question. But okay, that's fine. I'll take that very that that answer very succinct. Thank you very much, Tom. I think that's um, about all we have time for this evening. Um, there are a few more questions from students. Would you be happy for me to send them on to you to have a look at and respond to later when you're ready? Yes, I'll be delighted. I, I will do anything to help the cause of, of, of good design. And uh, I, will, I will always be happy to remind anybody that uh, my industrial design career started at the center, which I was very fond of. I, had a, I wasn't there for long, but um, there, there were there were such such great people that uh, that uh, were curating. It was it was it was it was great. And I'm sorry that my stuttering <laughs> uh, um, uh, 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 presentation isn't as smooth as it should have been. <laughs> Not at all, Tom. Thank you Not much at all. Organizing this. No, no, it's a great pleasure, and thank you, as usual, for your enormous generosity, sharing your knowledge, sharing your time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>